All right, let's gather around the campfire together. Who's ready for story time? Here we go. Once upon a time, a prince asked a beautiful princess, will you marry me? And the princess said, no. And so the prince lived happily ever after and rode his Harley and went four-wheeling with his buddies and he shot shotguns and had poker nights and Call of Duty marathons and the prince drank Coors Light from a red Solo cup and, and he smoked cigars in the house, all without a woman complaining. And the prince spent all his money on himself and he lived every day like he was Ferris Bueller while scratching himself whenever he wanted and leaving the toilet seat up. The end. Some of you are like, that's a fairy tale. Very funny and very true if you're a boy. Don't get me wrong. I like four-wheeling and, and shooting shotguns. I, I got a little redneck in me. And I do leave the toilet seat up in our house, which my wife Colleen appreciates a heck of a lot more than when I pee with it down. But I, I don't have big issues with guys who drink beer or play poker, uh, with guys who smoke cigars. What I do have an issue with, though, are the guys I know who glorify those things because they think they're a sign of real manhood. The truth is, being male doesn't necessarily mean you're a man. I told you this last week, there's 15-year-old men and there's 45-year-old boys. Yes, you could be an adult boy and you could be a teenage man, and I've met both of them. What I've come to believe is that the transition from boyhood to manhood is no longer marked by age or cultural stereotypes, but by things that are are more substantial. Things like your character, things like your actions, things like taking responsibility for your place in the world, actually living by an authentic code, one that's defined by strength, purpose, and integrity. Right now, guys, our world is hungry for real men to stand up, for the sons of God to start acting like fathers and sons. Unfortunately, in our modern world, men are increasingly MIA. We're missing in action, guys. Did you know this? Right now, one out of every three children in America is being raised in a home without the presence of their biological father. One in three kids without a father present in their lives. Statistically, children and families without a dad are four times more likely to live in poverty, repeat a grave, struggle with depression and emotional issues. It's a crisis. Sociologists have even surveyed the American prison system. Do you know the number one thing that most prison inmates have in common? It's not race. It's not age. It's not socioeconomic background. It's the absence of a man, a father in the home. The absence of strong, responsible men is one of the most destructive forces in our world across every continent. And church, I'm just telling you as pastor, we desperately need our boys to become men, men of honor. Guys, we need a new form of manliness that's more than superficial morality. It's time to man up. Would you say hoo-ha if you agree? Come on, hoo-ha. That'll be our new amen for this series. I'm Pastor Tim. I want to welcome you to Man Up, our special series on authentic biblical masculinity. Um, at Liquid, we just believe that being a true man, God's man, it's a high, it's a spiritual calling, and we have to reclaim it, men. Uh, last week I shared there's a powerful ancient code embedded in God's Word, the Bible, that reveals what it takes to become a man. Uh, every man that I love, every man I respect embodies this code, but unfortunately our culture has kind of buried it recently under layers of progressive, enlightened thinking, which dooms a lot of dudes to perpetual boyhood. No, I'm talking about me. I spent much of my 20s in a state of perpetual boyhood, living like Peter Pan, you know, I don't want to grow up. I don't want to take responsibility for my life. I don't want to assume responsibility for a woman. Chronologically, I was a man, but spiritually, I was an adolescent boy doing donuts in an emotional cul-de-sac. Men, I don't want you to be another boy victim. That's why we're doing this series, to encourage boys to man up. And if you're already a man of God, I want to encourage you today to stay strong. Keep doing what you're doing because this world's going to try to knock you off the wall. So how does a boy become a man spiritually, emotionally? You know, in some, uh, some ancient cultures, this is kind of cool. Boys had to climb a mountain and bring back an eagle feather. Isn't that kind of cool, right? In other tribes, boys had to drink the blood of the first deer they killed. It's kind of gross. <laughs> but the Bible lays out a much more powerful path to authentic manhood. And last week I introduced you to this passage in 1 Corinthians 16, which gives this instruction. Let's read it together, church. I'll put it on the screen. Big, loud voice. Here we go. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like what? Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now, 
Notice the Bible doesn't say, act like an adult. (laughs) It doesn't say, act like a well-rounded individual. It says, act like men. So the eyes of God, acting like a man, is a spiritual calling, something every guy should aspire to. Unfortunately, our culture has a much more stereotypical version of masculinity. It's red-blooded, it's robust, but sadly pretty superficial. What's a man according to our world? Does anybody remember this commercial? Hello, ladies. Look at your man. Now back to me. Now back at your man. Now back to me. Sadly, he isn't me. But if he stopped using ladies' scented body wash and switched to Old Spice, he could smell like he's me. Look down. Back up. Where are you? You're on a boat with the man your man could smell like. What's in your hand? Back at me. I have it. It's an oyster with two tickets to that thing you love. Look again. The tickets are now diamond. Anything is possible when your man smells like Old Spice and not a lady. I'm on a horse. (laughs) You gotta smell like a man, man. (laughs) Now that commercial is probably incorrect actually now. It's like hashtag cancel Old Spice. Uh, But the Bible lays out something much richer, much deeper, and a more powerful picture of what a true man looks like in the eyes of God. There are five marks of a man according to this passage. Did you see them? Paul says, be watchful. If you weren't here last week, we learned that where a boy lives day to day, a man has a godly vision for his life. Be watchful. He can see things. Men plan and think and invest in a longer-term vision for their life, for their family, for their work. And so I asked the men here a question. I said, do you have a grander vision for your life? And what I mean by that, does it require God's help or have you weaned out and downsized it? Did you discuss that with your small group guys? Men need a God-sized vision that gives shape and purpose to their life. Paul says, stand firm in the faith because the culture is going to try to knock you on your butt. So the Bible says, stand firm. We learn that real men aren't afraid to take a minority position, whereas boys tend to follow the crowd. They go with the flow, do whatever's easiest. But the Bible says, no, no, real men stand up in a crooked culture, even if nobody else does. And so I asked you guys, I said, hey, is there something in your life that you have softened your position on because of the potential for criticism? Is there some area of your work, your sex life, your marriage, your parenting that you've softened your position on because you fear criticism? You don't want to be the odd man out. The Bible says, no, no, you stand firm in the faith. Man up. And it says, act like men. Notice it's plural. In other words, real men are team players. Boys tend to be lone wolves. But guys, you were not created to be a lone wolf. Men actually need a wolf pack to run with. A group of guys committed to Christ, committed to each other. And it says, be strong. Let all that you do. In other words, this is about taking action. And we learned that real men work hard, whereas boys waste time playing video games, watching YouTube. Men take action in IRL, real life. We're not afraid to actually swing our axe, put in some sweat equity. We'll actually do the work. It says, let all that you do, all the action you take, all the work, be done in what? In love. Love is about caring for other people, serving and protecting them. And that's what I want to talk about today. How men are protectors, whereas boys are predators. They they prey on women. They prey on those who are vulnerable. They prey on those who are weaker. But real men are protectors. They're willing to actually sacrifice and, if need be, lay down their life for their family and friends, just like Jesus did. Say, hoo-ha! Hoo-ha! Amen? Now, what does it mean to be a protector? Well, last week, we looked at the life of Noah as an example of authentic manhood, and, and we saw Noah, man, he checked off all these five marks. There's a lot I like about Noah. Noah had this godly vision for his life. The Bible says Noah was a, remember this, a righteous man. He was blameless with the people of his time, and he, he walked faithfully with God. He, he wasn't afraid to take a minority position. The culture around Noah was very dark. You think it's dark now? His world was full of violence, corruption, sexual perversity, wickedness, and God, so much that God says, I'm done, okay? I'm going to wipe the entire earth with a flood. Every living thing is going to be wiped off the map, and I'm starting over with one man. Who do I pick? You, Noah. I choose you because, Noah, you're a weirdo. This dude is different. In a crooked world, Noah walked ramrod straight with God. And because of that, the Bible says Noah found what? He found favor in the eyes of the Lord. How do you find favor? Don't forget, guys. When you walk with God, he stands with you. And so God said, Noah, I want you to get to work. I want you to actually pick up your axe, and I want you to build a boat. You guys remember this? He said, build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with pitch or tar inside and out. And so Noah 
actually goes to work. He begins chopping. Actually, the Jewish tradition says he began planting trees because it took 120 years. Chopping trees, sawing lumber, plumbing lines. Guys, this is before chainsaws and power tools. There's not a drop of rain in the sky. But Noah wasn't afraid to obey God and actually put in the work. Does anybody recall how long it took him to build the ark? Anybody remember? 120 years. Look at me. Can you imagine working on the same project for over a century and two decades? Like, it made me wonder, like, what was driving Noah? What was his motivation? What gave him the perseverance to swing an ax for 120 years? Well, guess what? The Bible tells us. Hebrews 11 says, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to do what? Say it together, to save his family from the flood. In other words, he labored, he sweat, he put in the work for the salvation of his family. Because listen, men, the job of a real man is to see your family saved. It's to protect your family first. So listen to me, husbands. Listen to me, dads. Real men don't walk away from their marriages. Fathers don't walk away from their families or abandon their kids and surrender them to the world. Now, I understand you, you may have made mistakes. You may be, maybe you're divorced. You still have a powerful role to play in protecting and serving those you love. Real men are protectors. Now, what does that mean? I remember my daughter, I think, well, I was in fifth grade at the time. I'll tell you about my daughter in a minute. I was in fifth grade. I was 10 years old. There was a kid in our class named Joey. He was the class bully. Everyone has one every middle school. And Joey didn't pick on me, but he targeted this kid named Jimmy. I still don't know why. But every day after school, he would make Jimmy's life hell. It started with calling him names. He'd, he'd, he'd knock his notebooks out of his hands. And then turn into tackling Jimmy and giving him a wedgie after school. And nobody in my class would stand up to Joey because he was bigger, he was stronger. I think he got left back a grade. But I remember one day after school, everyone's gathered around the flagpole. And I thought, oh, maybe there's like a game going on, wiffle ball or something. But I got closer and saw that Joey had actually cornered Jimmy at the flagpole, and he had him in a headlock, and Jimmy's face was turning purple. Like the poor kid literally, like, he couldn't breathe. And some of the girls there are screaming, let him go, let him go! And Joey was just choking Jimmy out and going, what's the matter, Are you a girl? It was, it was bad. And I remember seeing this look of fear in Jimmy's eyes. And Joey just throws him to the ground. And, and Jimmy's kind of ga gasping under his breath. He goes, you're such a jerk. And Joey turns around and goes, what'd you say? And then he turns his back like he's going to walk away, and he wheels around and roundhouse kicks him in the face. And Jimmy's nose, boosh, exploded. Bright red blood everywhere, knocked out two teeth, absolute brutality. Fifth grade. He should have been charged with assault. But I remember thinking and standing there watching this, somebody needs to help Jimmy. Someone's got to stop this. But I froze. I just stood there with my notebook. I didn't do anything. I didn't step in. I didn't protect him. Why? Because I was a boy. I was, I was only 10 years old. Joey was bigger than me. He, he knew Taekwondo. <laughs> and part of me was just happy it wasn't me. But I, I look back on that failure now with a lot of regret. That I didn't actually step in and, and do something to protect Jimmy. Like, I... If I could go back and at least gotten a bloody nose myself trying to stop him, I wouldn't feel so much regret today as a man. But boys don't do that. Boys aren't protectors. Boys are predators, like Joey. They prey on the weak and the vulnerable. But men actually step in to protect physically, emotionally. Men lean in. Wherever there's conflict, they're not afraid to use their strength to step in and protect people who are weak or vulnerable. Now listen up, men. I'm not talking about, you know, powering up and kind of let's flex our muscles or use violence to get what you want the bible actually warns us it says do not envy a man of violence do not choose any of his ways so let me be super clear violence in any way to get your way it's boy stuff strength under control is man stuff it's to protect and defend i'm a i'm a father now so one of the ways that looks like for me is actually protecting my daughter and my son even although my son's taller than me now he doesn't really need my protection. He's like my bodyguard now, but <laughs> I remember my daughter, she was entering middle school, and I felt the need to help her, you know, prepare for the onslaught. There's going to be all the sexual stuff and all the temptations and pressures that boys were going to put on her, and Colleen always talked with my daughter about that kind of stuff, but as a man, as her father, I was like, it's my job to protect my kids, and I felt like the Holy Spirit nudging me, like, Tim, you need to talk openly 
with her about sex and the kind of stuff she's going to hear from punks like Joey and the things they're going to try. Now, I'll give you a warning, parents. This is PG-13. If you have little kids, you should have them in liquid family. If you have tweens or teens, go get them. Bring them in here. So I took my daughter out to dinner to have this talk. I think she's around 11 or 12. At least that's what she tells her therapist now. <laughs> my wife came with us too. So, so we go out to dinner and we order cheeseburgers. We're just kind of like sitting there eating. And so I'm like, hey, listen, sweetheart, you are such a young lady. And I'm just so proud of you. I mean, mom and I are like, you're starting middle school now. You're going to be with sixth, seventh, eighth grade boys. How do you feel about that? And she's like, I don't know. I'm kind of excited, but like, they have hairy legs, ew, you know. And I was like, yeah, that's not the only place they have hair. <sighs> like her eyes go wide. And I was like, honey, I just want to jump right in. I want to talk to you about sex. And I don't want to freak you out, but I just want you to be prepared. Because you're going to see, you're going to hear all kinds of stuff in middle school about sex. But I want you to hear it from me first. So, like, I assume, do you, like, do you know what sex is? And her eyes are wide, and she's just staring down at her cheeseburger. Like, like this is, this, like, focus on the cheeseburger. And I'm like, honey, don't, just look at me. Don't worry. Sex isn't bad. God invented sex, and it's a gift for, for mommies and daddies to enjoy in marriage. It's actually how, how babies are made, how we express love for each other. And what happens in sex, I go, lean in, lean in. I don't want everyone to hear this. It's actually quite natural. The, the husband's, his penis fills with blood, and it becomes erect. And when the husband and wife come together, typically they're in a bed. What they do is they sleep together. That's why you hear people say, oh, do you sleep with her? The penis goes into the mom's vagina, and it ejaculates. What that means is there's a fluid called semen. It's like this white sticky substance. That's the seed, and that moment feels amazing to both of them. The body physiologically responds with what's called an orgasm. Now, I say this, and I notice my wife is staring down at her cheeseburger because she, she's like, I am, what is happening here? And I say, hey, I know this sounds awkward, but it's something God created. And in marriage, it's a beautiful gift. Honey, it's how you and your brother got here. And she's like, Dad! I was like, give me one more minute. Here's the deal. The boys in middle school think about this around the clock. They barely think of anything else. Their main goal in life, understand, is to try and get girls to show their boobs or get in their pants and have some type of sexual experience together. Not necessarily intercourse, okay? Not like that full sex I just described. Some boys will actually ask girls, try to convince them to put their mouths on their privates. It's called oral sex, because you think oral, mouth. It's a very crude way. They're not going to call it that. The boys are going to, it's going to be very crude. This is terrible. I don't want to hear you say this, but I want you to know this is what they're going to talk about. They're going to call it a blowjob. And they're going to try to tell the girls, your friends, it's not really sex, but it is. And understand boys will say anything or do anything anything to touch a girl sexually because they're punk predators. And honey, I'm telling you this because I love you and I want to protect you. Sex is amazing inside God's gift of marriage and outside of it there's a lot of nasty stuff. Unwanted pregnancies, STDs, you know what those are? I had gym class, yes I know, abortions. Honey, mommy and I have a great marriage and part of that is because we saved ourselves in middle school and high school and college. Listen, listen to me. We weren't perfect, but we trusted that God designed sex for mommies and daddies in marriage, and we're really glad we did. Does that make sense? And suddenly the waitress comes by and she goes, hey, you guys haven't touched your food. <laughs> and Colleen's like, oh, uh, yeah, you can box it all up. I think we're ready to go home, you know. <laughs> now, my daughter's grown up in her 20s now, and, and she likes to tease me. She goes, dad, you sort of scarred me for life. <laughs> it's funny because she's a college student now, but but she's actually thankful. She goes, you know, I, I, I was a little shocked, but I was so happy now that you cared enough to lean into that and actively look out for me. Because I wasn't caught off guard when I was immediately confronted with that stuff. Man, it was super awkward. But can I tell you, it feels like protection because you're loving and looking out for your kids. So dads, I'm telling you, you got to man up. Let me tell you, if you're a father, you need to be the first one to talk with your kids about sex. As a pastor, in fact, listen to me. I want you to talk about it with them repeatedly, candidly. You be graphic, and you do it spiritually. Tell them what God's plan is, because the world's indoctrinating them with info about it. And you got to be the first to market with your kids on sex. Don't leave the first impression to TikTok or the middle school boys or the internet. You be the first to market source for sexual information in your family. You guys know this from the business world. In business, the first product to market has a competitive advantage over the others, right? 
So if you're the first one giving sexual facts to your child with a biblical framework, it is 10 times more powerful than communication coming later from others. You understand? I, told, I actually told my daughter on the way home, I said, listen, honey, I'm not going to keep pushing this, but I want you to know, this isn't a one-time talk. This isn't like birds and bees. Mommy and me want this to be the start of an ongoing conversation. And so we're going to talk about this all through middle school, high school, college, adults, and we want you to feel totally comfortable. Come with us. Come to us with any questions. Nothing is too awkward. If you don't hear a term you don't know, or you want, just tell us. We will tell you the truth. I promise you. And I did something similar with my son, but, but in a different way, because here's the deal. Parents, you get this. You know, you got you to gotta speak their language. When my son was 10 years old, we were down in Ocean City, and we liked to fish for fluke together. You ever go fluke fishing? Ton of fun. There's a picture of the little guy right there. And we would use these, these lures. They were pink-tailed fluke rigs with these little pink feathers on them. And every time you put the, 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 the pink feathers in, you know, the, the hook on it, the fluke, whammo, just hit them every time. And so we're fishing, and I hold one up. I said, son, I said, do you know what porn is? Now, he's going into middle school. And the reason I talk with him out, because statistically, the average age of a child's first exposure to porn is between 8 and 10 years old. Thank you, Internet. Thank you. And he's like, what? And I was like, I don't want to make it awkward. I'll just tell him. I was like, porn is naked pictures of people, like women's boobs, people doing sexual stuff. You're going to hear about it at school. And he's, he's like throwing his line, and he goes, I already have. Guys call it nudes. I said, okay, well, here's the deal. Porn is like this fishing lure. I said, you see how this thing is pink and it looks all fun and flashy to a fish, but what's it got inside? It's got this big hook, right? If you click on that image, understand, you are hooked. Porn is addictive. It's actually one of the ways Satan tries to trap men like you and me. We're the sons of God, right? We have the Holy Spirit in us. God wants us to be holy. Satan doesn't want us to act like men. So he acts like we're stupid fish. He wiggles a little, little porn in front of us, tries to get us, come on, come on, bite, bite, bite. And here's the deal. Your buddies are going to say, what's the big deal? It's just looking, it's not sex. But you know what Jesus said? He said, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in her, his heart. So it's, it's not about what's below your belt, it's what's in your heart. In other words, when you think about having sex with different women, which is that's what porn makes you do, it's like sinning in your mind. And porn's a trap because it trains your brain to see sexual pleasure by yourself without a real person. So watch what happens, Del. I'm almost done. When you get married, your mind is all messed up because you've got this mental Rolodex of images in your head. Do you understand? And it just goes, no, what's a Rolodex? I was like, well, that's just... I said, I, I'm just warning you, don't be a fluke. You understand? Sex is often, but it, awesome. It's for moms and dads and marriage only. And he goes, I know, you already told me this, Dad. I go, so when temptation comes, what are you going to do? He goes, I know, don't take the bait, he says. There's a hook inside. He's like, hey, I think I got one. And he starts reeling a fish in. And that was it. That was the whole conversation, probably three minutes long. We're just shoulder to shoulder fishing, and then we go on to the next thing. Men, you have to pick your spots and pepper it in the conversation. It's not just one and done. You, you drip that conversation in there all the time wherever you see an opening because the world is coming at them full force. My generation, I remember my friends, they, if they wanted to find porn, we, they would go to the 7-Eleven store and they'd d dumpster dive for the old magazines. Remember that? Now porn finds you. It's on your phone all the time coming for you. So you got to man up and protect your kids. You got to be willing to step in and set a higher standard. And that looks very different as your kids go through different seasons. My friend Brian Tome, who wrote Five Marks of a Man, again, a great book, want to give him credit. Brian actually has teenage daughters, and when they started dating, it was funny, he said, um, he goes, it's so funny how guys think about this. He goes, can you imagine if a 16-year-old boy knocked on your door and said, hey, I'm here to borrow your truck, like you never met this kid before. Can you just give me your keys to your truck, take it out for a ride? You'd be like, heck no. And yet... When that same kid comes to pick up your daughter for her first date, we just hand her over. He goes, that's crazy. And Brian said, I ain't going to be that way with my daughters. So when his daughter's first date showed up at their house, he actually put his shotgun on the kitchen counter <laughs> and invited him in. <laughs> in fact, what he did is when his daughter's date arrived, he actually met the guy at the door and he said, listen, I'm glad you're here to pick up my daughter, but before you go out with her, I'm going to go out with you. Let's go. Get in the car. And the boy's like, what, what? And he goes, go ahead, you drive, you drive. Because he wanted to see how fast the kid drove. 
And so they go to the burger joint around the corner, and he says, look, listen, listen, you want a milkshake? And he's like, no, I'm not really feeling like eating anything. <laughs> and he's like, listen, I'm not trying to bust your chops, but I want you to know I love my daughter more than anything in the world. There's nothing I wouldn't do. You understand? And let's just be honest, this relationship is probably not going to last very long, okay? Let's just <laughs> and so I have some questions for you, and I want some assurances from you before you go out with her. First thing, I need to know you're going to protect her reputation and speak well of her when you're together and when you aren't. Are we clear? Can you do that? The kid was like, yes, sir. And they said, all right, well, this one's more than yes, sir. What are your sexual intentions? How, how far do you plan on going? And the kid's kind of like, uh, uh, he says, a little, little, you know. And so Brian's like, uh, you're going to hold hands? Kiss her? First base, second base? Because here's the deal. My daughter doesn't play baseball, you understand? And he's like, uh, yeah, so what are you going to do? He goes, maybe hold hands, we're going to the movies. Now, let's just be real about this, okay? What a teenage boy says in that moment <laughs> doesn't always line up with what he may do when dad's not around and the hormones are raging. But the point is, the conversation needs to happen if my friend was going to be a man who protects his family. And it's funny because they say, well, how did that go? He goes, well, when I got home, he goes, it's funny, my older son actually gave me a fist bump. And he said, way to go, dad. Boom. And his wife was like, thank you. His daughter, <gasps> aghast, but later thanked him. Why? Because the whole family saw that dad was still on his game. You understand? He was still engaged. He was still doing his job as protector, and they all took great comfort in that. Listen, men, we are living right now in the days of Noah. Statistics show that almost 20% of all women on college campuses will be victims of sexual assault or rape. 20%, that's one in five. Why? Because we are raising too many boys who are predators and not enough who are protectors. You understand? Yeah, you can give God a praise for that. We need protectors at every level. So let me talk straight to the young men here. If you're in your teens, or your 20s, or if you're in your 30s, whatever, I don't know. The deal is this. When it comes to sex, boys think the only rule is whether a girl agrees or not. Boys in our culture say, well, you know, if we're both consenting, what's the big deal? Boys always think, if something feels good, I get away with it, why not? But godly men don't live by the, if I can, I'll do it code. You know what we do? We actually put the girl's future ahead of our pleasure. So single men, you have to ask this question. You ready? Take a screenshot of this. You have to ask, am I protecting her future or prioritizing my pleasure? In other words, are your sexual choices driven by her future or your pleasure right now? Listen, men, your self-control as a man now protects her health physically, emotionally, spiritually in the future. Because every woman knows that a man who can actually control himself while dating is a man who can be trusted to control himself later when married, which is a huge source of security. Not only that, you protect your future wife by going into marriage with, a, with as little sexual baggage as possible. I'm not just talking about the physical consequences of sleeping around. Biblically, there are spiritual ramifications when a man and a woman sleep together. I mean, I think you guys get it. Physically, you become one flesh. That's what the Bible calls it. Spiritually, there's this, this fusion of souls. You understand? Boys don't get that. They don't think on a spiritual level. I only want what feels good right now. And we live in a culture that perpetuates the myth that body and soul can just be separated. It's just sex. They can't. When a husband and wife become one physically, you understand, it mirrors the way uh, that God is one as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One. Married men, listen to how Ephesians 5 describes your job. Listen to this. Husbands, love your wives. Love the girl. How? Just as Christ loved the church and did what? gave himself up for her. Married men, what's your job description? <laughs> to love your wife like Jesus loved his, the church. What, what did Jesus do for his bride? <laughs> he died for her, bro. He literally laid down his life for you. And men, we have to be willing to die for your woman. Some of you are like, well, she's killing me already, Tim. <laughs> Listen to me. <laughs> Marriage requires dying to yourself. It's prioritizing her needs ahead of yours. It's earning your money to provide for her. 
It's sacrificing your time to be with her. You may, that means you may need to die to Saturday golf or Friday game night with your buddies to actually spend time with her. That's what it means to man up in marriage. You're the first to die. Choose me in all the little ways to your own desires so that she feels protected and loved and cared for. I mean, guys, do you remember who wrote Ephesians 5 here? I mean, this, this is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was beaten. He was flogged. He was shipwrecked. He was lashed. He was stoned. Paul was a man's man. And he's literally telling men to lay down their lives for their wives. Why? Because men are protectors and boys are predators. So men, it's time to step up. It's time to start protecting the women and the children in our lives and the future women in your lives. And as you do, you model the love of Christ. So here's three questions for every man here. Depending on your season of life, here's the practical application. Ready? Single guys. If you're a single dude, will you define your sexual boundaries before you go out with anyone? Okay? I, I know it's awkward, but are you willing to actually make it a point of conversation on the second date or sooner? I, guaranteed you're both thinking about it, okay? I'm like, why not actually bring it into the light in a healthy way, call out temptation points, draw a line, and then watch, take a step back. Actually prioritize her future over your pleasure. For married dudes... What are the consequences to you, your family, and your wife if you cheat on her? What I would encourage you to do is actually sit down and make a list. Like, just like, in fact, just watch the news and watch what devastation and heartache it causes. Next week, I'm going to talk about some of the boundaries that I actually have in my personal life to protect my marriage and to protect this church. Because you might have noticed pastors aren't immune. In fact, leaders, if you serve in ministry, you got a big old bullseye target on, the for, on your forehead, on your back. The Bible says, strike the shepherd and the sheep scatter. Satan is having a field day right now, blowing up churches with sex scandals, giving Jesus a black eye. Men, be better than that. Act like men. And if you're a father, here's my question. Have you talked candidly about sex with your kids yet? If not, as your pastor, let me encourage you, do it repeatedly. Do it graphically. Do it spiritually push past the awkwardness, and start the conversation. Tell them about God's amazing design and be first to mark it. Don't let that crucial conversation, don't leave it up to the culture. We all need to man up, amen? Like Noah did. Remember him? You're like, I forgot about Noah. Noah walked straight with God in crooked culture. And you know what happened at the end of his life? Listen to this, end of the story. The Bible says, when Noah was how old? 600 years old. On the 17th day of the second month, bloop, bloop, all the underground waters erupted from the earth, and the rain fell in mighty torrents from the sky. Drip, drop, drip, drop, and Noah's like, what is this? I've been working 100, 120 years. It starts raining, and it rains nonstop for 40 days, 40 nights, until the entire earth is covered by a flood. And Genesis says this, as the waters rose higher and higher above the ground, the boat floated what? Safely on the surface. Finally, the water covered even the highest mountains on the earth, rising more than 22 feet above the highest peak. So I want you to imagine right now, there's water covering Mount Everest. There's water over Kilimanjaro. There's water over the Himalayas. All of it's underwater. The Bible says everything that breathed and lived on dry land died. All the people, the livestock, the small animals, the birds, all were destroyed. Total destruction across the earth, except for one man and his family. The only people who survived were Noah and who? Those with him in the boat. Why did Noah spend a century two decades building a boat to save his family. The Bible says eight people went into that ark. Noah, his wife, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. Eight people. Only one family was saved. Why? Because Noah walked faithfully with God in a crooked culture and did everything exactly as God told him. And when judgment day came, guess what? His whole family was saved because they were safe in God's ark of protection. Guys, do you understand the parallel? Just like Noah's ark was God's vessel of salvation back in Genesis, 
Jesus Christ is the ark of salvation for Christians today. The only way to live straight in a crooked world is to put your full faith and trust in Jesus Christ and say, I'm going to live only for him, not for the world, no matter what it costs, because the world is flooded with sin right now. You understand this? We are living in the days of Noah. There is violence, there is lust, arrogance, greed, decadence. We are seeing rebellion against God openly celebrated. We're living in the days of Noah. And the next event on God's calendar is actually the return of Jesus Christ to judge the living and the dead when we least expect it. Jesus said this about Noah. When the Son of Man returns, it will be exactly like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, what were the people doing? Enjoying banquets, going to parties. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. In other words, the majority of our world will not see it coming. People will be going to work, out to lunch, shopping at malls, throwing parties, just like in Noah's day. But on that moment, the heavens will open, a trumpet will sound, and Jesus Christ will return. And some will be saved, and some will be destroyed. Jesus said, two men will be out in the field. One will be taken, the other left. And then he warns, so you too, you guys, you must keep watch. For you don't know what day your Lord's coming. So you don't have to be afraid if you're a believer. When you see dark days getting darker around you, it's a sign your Savior's coming soon. Amen? Hoo-ha! And all who trust in Christ, who are walking faithfully with God, will be saved. Amen? I'll end with this. Remember how God told Noah to, he said, seal the boat with, with tar or pitch. The Hebrew word is pitch. Because pitch made the ark waterproof. It protected it from the water, the judgment getting inside. So pitch is, understand, a protective sealant. This is kind of cool. Do you have the Hebrew word for pitch? It's the root for the word atonement. Same word. Atonement is a fancy way of saying God forgives our sins and reconciles us to himself through the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus atoned. He paid for our sins when he laid down his life as the perfect man on the cross. Do you get it? God saved Noah's family with the atonement of pitch. Guess what? Your soul has been saved with the atonement of Jesus' blood. So you will be saved for all eternity. Your faith is waterproof. Your faith is fireproof because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He's your ark of salvation. So my question today is, are you in the ark? Have you stepped out of the world and by faith stepped into the ark of salvation by trusting in Jesus Christ? Every single man under the sound of my voice, you are going to meet Jesus Christ one day. And the question is, will you greet him as your savior or as your judge? Don't be afraid. Stand up. Man up. Man up for God. Stand up for your families. Stand up for your children. Live counter to this toxic culture and walk boldly with Jesus Christ. Men, that's my prayer for us. That we aren't known by the world for our, you know, physical strength or size, but let us be known. Those men at Liquid, they walked faithfully with their God like Noah. May that be what we're known for. Hoo-ha! Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this powerful word, God. We're inspired by Noah, but Lord, we're sobered too because we see the floodwaters rising all around us. And we want to gather up those we love, Lord, and escape to an island. But you invite us into this ark, and that ark is Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I'm praying right now for, for every man here, Lord. I pray for every child, every teen, every woman who's even here right now, under the sound of my voice, who knows they need your salvation. Before you can save your family, guys, you got to be saved by Christ. It's actually pretty easy. It's as easy as A, B, C. A is you just need to admit your sin. I'm going to lead you in a prayer in a moment for you to just confess your sin wherever you've fallen short. Believe, put your full faith in Jesus Christ. He really died for you. He was really raised for your life. And then see, you commit to follow him. Not perfectly. He'll give you the Holy Spirit. He gives you grace. He'll forgive you again and again. But you've got to try to walk with him. Those are the ABCs of how you become a Christian. And so I'm going to invite you to pray with me. In fact, let's all just kind of pray out loud right now. I don't want anyone to feel left out. Just pray with me. Say, Jesus, I need a Savior. Thank you for dying for me. I believe you are the God-man from heaven sent to this earth to die for my sins. Thanks for giving your life on a cross for me. Forgive me, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. 
I commit to follow you with my life. And God, help me. Help me lead those I love, protect and serve them, and live with integrity until you return. I give you my life. Thank you for yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, let's give God a big praise for everyone who's entering the family of God. Praise God for you. Welcome to the family. Thanks for watching the Liquid Church YouTube channel. Hey, and don't stop here. I want to invite you to be part of our online community. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this with a friend. You know, everybody's welcome to join us. If you were blessed by this message, you can support our ministry by clicking the Give Now button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Christ. Thanks so much for watching. God bless.